Let it be so. Hallelujah. Revival changes everything. Hallelujah. Good to see you all this morning. We're glad you're here. Praise God. Y'all brought a Bible? You're going to need it this morning. I've got seven passages of Scripture we're going to turn to today. Let it begin right here, Lord. In Jesus' name, let it begin right here. I'd like for you to make your way over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. That's where we're going to begin. And over the course of our message this morning, we'll look at seven different passages. I'll probably, uh, I'll probably cite a number of others, but these are the ones we'll look at. Last week, I came to the church during the week. Me and Tipito like to come and visit when the cleaning lady's here. <laughs> when the cleaning lady's here, busy, and we like to sneak in, and Tipito loves to walk all around the church and sniff everything, and that's all he does is sniff, by the way, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when we popped in this week, she was... She had just been down cleaning a coffee stain out of out of the carpet, working on that, and uh, that's there's always stuff to do. They had another place she was scraping some gum up and cleaning up some gum, and and she's still working on a pretty heavy grease stain that's somebody tracked in on their shoes, you know, that was in the back of the carpet. But you know, this is what happens when you have traffic in a in a place, because whatever's on your shoes, it's, you know, you walk on the carpet, guess where it's going to go? It's going to go on the carpet. So uh, whether that's mud or grease or grass stains or whatever that is, and, and, and not only that, but we have a lot of activities here, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. And those activities usually include food and, and beverages, and you know what happens when you have coffee or tea or cold drinks or fruit juice, by the way, communion itself being juice, you know, juice tends to stain things, any kind of fruit juice stains things. So, you know, that's just the way it is. I, I'm not complaining, by the way, because the Bible says where no oxen are, that's where the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of an ox. So it's a powerful passage that teaches a, a principle. Here's the principle. Where if there's no chickens in the chicken coop, then the chicken coop is clean. But there's no eggs there either. So if you want eggs in the chicken coop, you got to have chickens. And if you have chickens, then you got to clean up the chicken coop. You know, that's just the way it is, right? I mean, that's, that's just life. Where we could say... Uh, where no babies are, there the nursery is clean. But we like the babies in the nursery. So if there's babies in the nursery, there you, you got to clean. Where no children are, there the Sunday school classes are clean. But we want children in the Sunday school class. And when there's children in Sunday school classes, what do you have to do? You, you got to clean up. It's the same way with your house or the church building, so I'm not complaining, I'm going to make a point. You know, there are stains that get on carpet and stains from food. By the way, you know why I wear shirts like this? Because I wear my food. And so oftentimes... If I've got a colorful shirt with lots of designs on it, you can't see it. You, you can't tell. So I like, I like, you know, bright colored clothes. It's a part of the Italian in me. So, you know, if it's yellow, if it's orange, if it's red, I like it. I had a brand new shirt last year, brand new shirt 
wore it the first time. I made it all the way through the service. Didn't spill, spill anything on it. But when I sat down to eat, I was eating at one of those Italian restaurants where you dip the bread in the olive oil. I mean, you're Italian, you can't resist that. And you know where the olive oil went. It went on my brand new shirt. And it didn't come out. So I can't wear the shirt. I mean, it's a nice shirt, but it doesn't matter how pretty it is, doesn't matter how expensive it is, it's got a big stain. And if you looked at me and you looked at my shirt, you wouldn't say nice shirt. You'd say, that's all you'd see is that big stain, the big stain on the shirt. So I don't get to wear that shirt. Some stains, permanent. Some stains you can get out. Some stains not even a cleaner can get out. But here's the point that I'm going to make. Of all the stains, clothes, carpet, towels, whatever it is, of all the stains, nothing stains like sin. Nothing stains like sin. A food stain, a juice stain, that only stains the clothes, the towel, the carpet. But sin stains deep. It stains all the way to the innermost part of the soul. It stains deep into the heart, into the life, into the very character, into the very personality. A stain in your shirt might ruin the shirt. A stain on the carpet, well, it might just be there. <laughs> but when st sin stains the soul, it ruins the life. It ruins the whole life. It destroys the very soul. It destroys the peace, the joy. It destroys families. It destroys health. Sin penetrates deep, all the way to the innermost part of the being. It stains the very fabric of the soul. I want you to listen. Or I want you to look with me here in Jeremiah 17. This is the first scripture we're going to look at today. I want you to see how the Bible, how God describes sin in this passage. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 1, he says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. And with the point of a diamond. Now, a diamond is the hardest naturally occurring substance on earth. It is written with the point of a diamond. It is graven. It's engraved upon the table of their heart. It's like the heart is stone and it has to be carved. It has to be engraved on the heart and upon the horns of your altars. It is engraved. It's written with a pen of iron. Iron like a, I think the Bible actually calls it a nail. Like you could, you know how you can engrave something with a nail? You can scrape your initials, whatever, in something. Well, that's what this is talking about. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. And with the point of a diamond, it's engraved. It's etched. In other words, it's permanent. It's engraved there, and it's not coming out. Listen to how one version translates this. People of Judah, your sins cannot be erased. They are written on your hearts like words chiseled in stone or carved on the corners of your altars. It's like a permanent tattoo. You know, you can wash a tattoo. It's not coming off. You can rub it really good with soap. You can wash it all day, all night, 24 hours a day. It's not coming off. It's embedded. It's implanted. It's, it's not going to be removed. And if, if you have a look up about how you get stains out of things, there's a thousand remedies, you know. You use vinegar. You use salt. You use this. You use that. You use bleach. You use whatever. You'd be surprised at the number of things that actually stain. But here's what the Bible says. 
the stain of sin penetrates all the way down so that it is etched and engraved upon the, the stony heart of the sinner. And since you're right here in Jeremiah 17, let's look at our second passage of Scripture for the morning, and that's going to be in Jeremiah chapter 2. You'll make your way over here. Jeremiah chapter 2, because God is speaking, of course, to Judah about their sin, their rebellion, their backsliding, their idolatrous practices their rejection of God and their rejection of the truth of God. And here's what God says in Jeremiah 2. I want to read verse 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, nitre translated lie in many versions, though you wash with lie and take thee much soap, yet Thine iniquity, that is your sins, is marked before me. It's marked. That Hebrew word means Brown Driver and Briggs, the Hebrew lexicon, says marked means st to be stained, to be engraved, or to be deeply stained, to be deeply stained. Even though you wash with lye, try it all. Try that, what they call that, uh, carbonate of soda. Try the, the soda, water, fizzy, whatever. Try the vinegar. Try it all. It's not going to remove the stain of your sin. Take thee much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me. Now, here's the picture. Your sin is etched, deeply stained, so that when God sees the sinner, he sees the stain. That's what he sees. No matter how good they think of themselves, God sees the stain. Just like on my shirt that I ruined, you see me? That's where your eye's going to go, right to that big, ugly stain on my shirt. Well, that's the picture we have right here. Your iniquity is marked before me. One translation translates it this way, even though you wash with lye and use an abundance of soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me. That's what he sees. That's the idea. It's before me. It's in front of me. That's what he sees. God sees the stain, the stain of sin. Not only will no amount of soap, lye, detergent, bleach, not only will that not remove it, no self-improvement is going to remove it either. No amount of self-improvement will remove it. You can take a class, self-improvement class. You can join a spa. You can go to meetings. You can go to seminars, but it's not going to remove that stain that's engraved. No amount of remorse will remove it. No amount of tears that you shed. Look, there's a lot of people who have remorse for their actions. They ruin their lives, ruin their health, ruin their marriage, ruin their kids, ruin their job. They ruin everything because of their sin, whatever that sin, whatever form that sin took. But remorse alone doesn't remove the stain of sin. You can join a church. That doesn't remove the stain of sin. You can be baptized a sinner. That won't remove the stain of sin. You'll just be a wet sinner. The stain won't come out. It's engraved. It's embedded. It's tattooed. I'll tell you something else. There's a lot of people who think that if they give, they give a lot to a church. Maybe, maybe even people who, who, who realize their mortality I've got all this money. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to give it to a church, and that way the church can pray me out of whatever my punishment may be for the life that I've lived. That doesn't remove your stain. It doesn't remove the stain of sin. In fact, the third passage that I would like for us to turn to today 
is in the book of Isaiah. Since you're here in Jeremiah, if you just go forward a little bit to, Jer to Isaiah, we're going to read one verse in Isaiah chapter 64. I, I'm going to read some familiar verses today. I hope that's okay. I want us to see them in the light of our subject today. Isaiah 64, one verse, verse 6. This, again, speaking to Judah, supposed to be the people of God. We can relate this to ourselves because we're supposed to be the people of God. In Isaiah 64, listen to what God said through Isaiah, beginning in verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. An unclean thing, it means to be vile, to be polluted, to be defiled. We are all as an unclean thing. And all, all our righteousnesses, all our righteousnesses, all our good deeds, all the good we do, even our almsgiving, how nice we are, how kind we are, how polite we are. We're, we're kind to animals. We donate to charity. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Again, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, the Hebrew lexicon translates it minstrel rags. And we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We do all fade like a leaf. You know how when the wind blows, you got all these dried leaves that are just blowing with the wind. The, the leaves have withered. The leaves are dead. The wind blows, and there goes the leaves. Dry. Well, this is what the Bible describes our human life. Our human life is like that. We fade. We blow with the wind. And notice he says, all of us. That means without exception. All of us are so deeply stained by the guilt of our sins that even the good things we do are polluted by our uncleanness. That uncleanness would include things like impure motives, by the selfishness, by the pride that's at the core of our being. The truth is here that nothing we do, nothing we do, gains us God's approval. Nothing. No good works, no good deeds, none of it gains us God's approval. And here's the big problem. We all tend to think that we're better than we are. You know, that is part of the deception of the human nature. Our own, our own nature will deceive us. Because other people's sins are so glaring. We can see them so clearly. Oh, I can see all their faults, but we, we can't see our own. Or we minimize ours and magnify the sins of others. We can see all their faults, flaws, the cracks in their personality. We can see it so clearly. And yet we're blind and oblivious to our own faults. And we tend to think that come judgment day, Boy, other people are going to have a big problem. They, when they got to give an account for their sins, they got a big problem coming up. But, but, but me, me, you know, I, I'm a good person. I do my best. I do my best. I'll be okay on judgment day. God will look at me and he'll say, you did your best. but our best isn't good enough. Our best, no matter how good it is, it's not good enough. I like the analogy of the man who tries to jump over the Grand Canyon. You know, it's a mile across. Hey, you can do your best because heaven's on the other side. Do your best. You better get a running start. You might make it 20 feet. You might make it 20 feet. But you still got the rest of that mile to go. You're going to fall short. Your best isn't good enough. Nobody gets to heaven by their efforts. 
Nobody gets to heaven by their giving it their best. Y'all follow me? Well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. That's the problem. That is the problem. He, he does know your heart. You don't know your heart. You think you know your heart. You pretend you know your heart. You think your heart's better than what it is. But God does know your heart. And he knows all the impurity there. He knows all the uncleanness there, all of the selfishness, the pride, the ego, all the vileness. He knows it perfectly. He knows the unbelief. He knows the faults, the flaws, the failures. He knows the things that bubble down there and seethe and all of that uncleanness. Yes, he knows your heart. You keep telling yourself you're a good person because here's what the Bible says. Romans 3. I'm just going to read these verses to you because you're so familiar with them. But Romans 3, verses 10, 11, and 12, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Not a single one. There is none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They've all missed the mark. They've all wandered off the right path. They are all together become unprofitable. The whole lot of humanity. There is none that doeth good, not a single one. And in Romans 3 and verse 23, he says, For all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short. You've come up short. They, they did their best. They got to run and start. They did their best to leap over the Grand Canyon, but they came up short. They missed the mark. They failed to measure up. All God sees, Jeremiah says, is the stain. What what can cleanse this stain? So a stain so penetrating, so pervasive, no fuller soap, no dry cleaner, no bleach. It's carved with the pen of iron. It's carved with the, the point of a diamond. It led a Baptist preacher named Robert Lowry not too many years after the Civil War. He was a Baptist preacher and a hymnist, and he he penned an old hymn that became a favorite for, I guess, a hundred years. What can wash away my sin? What? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. There's no other place you're going to get washed clean. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang a number of songs today about the blood of Jesus. Nothing can my sin erase. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of works. Tis all of grace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, the words to these stanzas, even the songs we sang today, simple, very simple, and yet precious truth and profound truth. There is blood that stains, and then there is blood that cleanses. There's blood that washes away even the stain of sin so deep that it cannot be removed otherwise. It's otherwise uncleansable, irremovable. Back when this hymn was first written, back I think it was 1870s, when it was first written, nothing but the blood of Jesus. When it was first written, they had a scripture verse attached to the hymn. It was Hebrews 9.22 that, that says, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no remission, no forgiveness, no deliverance. 
That's what the word remission means. Deliverance, forgiveness, freedom, because it's freedom from the chain of sin and freedom from the guilt and shame of sin. But after a number of years, they took that scripture verse out of the hymn books and they kept the hymn in there. But you know, today, there aren't many hymn books that still publish songs about the blood of Jesus. Not too many. There's still a few, but people have begun have come to think that those old concepts aren't pertinent anymore. That uh, that's why nowadays there's very little preaching anymore about the cross, the blood, uh, the atonement. It's all about you, motivating you to just be a better person. Motivating you, you know, tell yourself, you look at yourself in the mirror and you tell yourself, you got this. You can do this. I'm a winner. I'm victorious. And yet, they think they're doing great, but God sees what? A huge stain, a huge stain of sin that no amount of self-improvement, self-motivation, it's not going to erase that. I think it's a tragedy that modern hymnals, very few, include any songs about the blood of Jesus. Because men today think they're so much better than they are. And that, that's some old primitive concept of blood atonement. Well, blood atonement, the idea of blood sacrifice, it does go a long way back. I mean, the first time we read about it, it's Abel bringing a blood sacrifice before God. And God accepted the blood sacrifice while rejecting the sacrifice of his brother Cain. It's possible that even Adam and Eve made a blood sacrifice because somewhere they got animal clothes to put on to cover their sin. So did they sacrifice the animal? Probably. But blood sacrifice was common in Old Testament times. Abraham sacrificed. He offered blood sacrifices. And Noah offered blood sacrifices. But it was Moses, once you get to Moses, who on Passover... By the word of God, speaking as God's spokesman, told all the Jews that were living in Egypt, you go slaughter a lamb, a lamb for a house, and you dip that hyssop into the blood of that lamb, and you brush it over your doorpost and windows, because tonight, the angel of death is going to come through Egypt and slay the firstborn in every house. Only the houses with blood over the doorposts and windows will be spared. Everybody else will be killed. And then, also under Moses, Moses gave the law, which was, the law was a, an elaborate system of sacrifice, of animal sacrifice, of, of bloodshed. Animals were sacrificed continuously to demonstrate to the people what sin does. It destroys, it kills, and blood is necessary to cover sin. So this elaborate system was established of blood sacrifice that required an altar, a special kind of altar, one that was never chiseled, one that was never touched with human hands as far as to carve it or anything else. It had to be natural stone. And then a special priesthood who only could offer sacrifice on that altar, who wore special garments, specifically detailed in the law, special washing, special purifications, special sacrifices, special rituals, all that had to be adhered to continuously in a system of law and sacrifice that lasted about 1,500 years. But it was never intended to be permanent. The law, the sacrifices, I would think of it like uh, the blue tarps on people's roofs. You know, the Old Testament sacrifices would temporarily cover the problem. It would cover the sin temporarily, like a blue tarp on your roof. Hey, it'll cover the roof for a little while. 
but it's not intended to be a permanent solution. You better, you better, you better consider a permanent solution quickly. Well, the Old Testament sacrifices were not considered to be permanent solutions. That's what the Bible says repeatedly. Otherwise, why would they have to keep offering them day after day after day? They're not a permanent solution. In fact, I would like you to turn to, where are we? Are we the fourth scripture? Well, make your way, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll read a couple of verses over here. Hebrews 10, whatever number we're on, it's, <laughs> I think it's four. Hebrews 10, that's where we're going to read this, this morning. I'm going to read a couple of verses over here. The permanent solution, of course, to sin was Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, who would die once for all, lay down his life in a once-for-all ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews 10, we're going to read beginning in verse. Well, uh, let me just read in verse 1. The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. The sacrifices couldn't do everything permanently. If they could have, verse 2, they, you, they wouldn't have to be offered all the time. But verse 3 says, in the sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. If a debt was paid, if the sacrifice paid the debt, why do you have to keep paying it? Why do you have to keep doing it? Why do you keep making installments if the debt is paid? Y'all follow? He says in verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Not possible. It's a blue target. It covers the sin, but it's not a permanent solution. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body you have prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, <coughs> excuse me, Thou hast no pleasure. In verse 9, it says, Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He takes away the first. What does that mean? He ended the Old Testament covenant. He ended the Old Covenant. He took it away. How? By offering himself as a sacrifice, he established the second covenant, that is the new covenant. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified, that, that means cleansed, set apart, consecrated, purified, regarded by God as holy. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering Oft time, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. You know what priests did, right? They offered sacrifice. People brought their offerings all day, all day, all day, at one after another, after another, after another. Thousands of animals were sacrificed. Thousands. Not just uh, over the period of over the period of fifteen hundred years. We can't imagine how many animals were sacrificed. Millions. And this is what it says. They can never take away sins. The priest stood all day, all day, slaughtering, butchering, draining blood from these animals. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and you know he's speaking of Christ, one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. What a contrast. The priest was standing all day, every day. Why were they standing? Because they were working. But Christ offered himself for our sins and sat down. Who sits down when you're done? One sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down and said, it is finished. It's done. Down in verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected 
forever those that are sanctified. One offering, one offering to God. In verse 19, we sang this today. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, that is confidence, liberty, free access, fearless confidence, we have boldness to enter into the holiest, the holy place, the holy of holies, where nobody could go into the very presence of God. We can go by the blood of Jesus. Only the high priest could enter there once a year. Y'all familiar with these passages. Once a year, the high priest could enter into the holiest, he went in with fear and trembling. We can go in freely without fear. We can go in boldly. How is that? By the blood of Jesus. We have boldness to enter into the very presence of God in heaven by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus gives you access to Almighty God. Direct access. That's why Jesus told us we can pray when we pray, Father. You have access into the presence of Almighty God. You don't have to go through a mediator. You, you come through Jesus Christ through his blood. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through saints. You don't have to go through Mary. You don't have to go through your dead Uncle George. You can pray directly to God in heaven through Jesus Christ. We have free access. Take advantage of this access and talk to the Lord like you would talk to your closest friend because that's what he is. In Hebrews 9, 14, you don't have to turn there, but it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How superior is the blood of Christ to the blood of animals? How superior is the blood of Christ? Acts 20, 28 calls the blood of Christ the blood of God. Powerful passage. Paul told the elders of the church in Ephesus to the overseers, he says, you feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Powerful, powerful. It also exposes how prideful men are who, who think that we can cleanse ourselves by our works, by our goodness. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. God will look at me and he'll say, you did your best. Your best is good enough. God sees the stain of every man's sin. What can wash away my sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I got another scripture for you, whatever one this is. I think it's five. I'm in Revelation chapter one. I'd like you to make your way there. Y'all can hang with me a little bit. Revelation chapter one. We're going to read a couple of, just a couple of verses here. I want us to read these today. Revelation chapter 1, verse, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. Revelation 1, John, verse 4. To the seven churches in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is and was and is to come. And from the seven spirits that are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There is blood that stains and there is blood that cleanses. The blood of Calvary's cross cleanses us. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us, the Greek word luo. It means to bathe, to wash, to cleanse, to loose. Bathe, wash, cleanse. If you 
had a child or if you were a child. I think most of you were a child <laughs> at one point. That would be my guess, except Glenn. He was born old. You ever fell or had your child fall, scrape their knee, get dirt in their knee, get, uh, you know, you got to wash it, you got to cleanse that wound, you got to get all the dirt out of it. Maybe it happened to you. Well, the Lord's cleansing blood penetrated deep and washes away even the sins etched upon our stony hearts washed away all the guilt, the shame, the guilt and shame tattooed indelibly, it washed away, it cleansed, it removed. He has washed our sins away. Washed all my sins away. Washed all my sins away. There are stains that can't be removed, not by any detergent, not by any launderer, but there is no stain of sin that Christ's blood cannot remove. And then, not only did he wash our sins away, the Bible says he replaced our hard heart, our stony heart, with the heart of flesh. And that'll be my sixth passage we'll look at today, and this one is in Ezekiel chapter 36. You can turn there if you like, or you can just listen. But in Ezekiel 36 and verse 26, God is speaking a promise to Israel in the latter days. We're in those latter days now, and there's going to be a great awakening, a great revival, a great moving in Israel. It may be after we are gone, in rapture, I hope, but in verse 26, he says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away, take away, it means to remove. I'll get rid of that one completely. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. That old heart, selfish, stubborn, self-willed, Prideful, rock hard, cold. The human heart can be so cold and unfeeling. It can go from love to hate just like that. And words can come out. They were so kind and so gracious, and boy, they can turn to venom just like that. That old heart so defiant, so so rebellious against God, so full of unbelief, so angry so lustful, so enamored by this wicked world, that old heart, he says, I will take it away. I will remove it. I'll take that old heart away, and I'll replace it with a brand new heart, a redeemed heart, a soft heart, a tender heart, a loving heart, a kind heart, a gracious, generous, genuine heart. And he said, I'll give you a new spirit. I'll put a new spirit within you. The very spirit of God will indwell you. That's what we want. That's what we need. Come, Holy Spirit. And you will never be the same. Once God removes that heart of stone, once you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, you get a new heart, and you'll never be the same. You'll find you don't love the same things you used to love. You'll find you hate things now that you used to like. You'll find you take pleasure in things you never thought you would before. And you'll also find that things that once gave you great pleasure, you now, you now reject and you no, no longer desire. The alcoholic loses their taste for the booze. The addict loses their taste, their desire for the, to feed their addiction. The selfish become unselfish. The prideful are humble. It's a new heart. 
a heart that once loved the world now turns away from the world and loves the things of God. How can that be? How can a person go from loving this world and all its evil to suddenly transform so that all the things of the world no longer attract them? All of its pleasures, its dainties, its attra- they no longer attract them. What attracts them now? I just want to serve the Lord. I want to please the Lord with my life. I want all of my actions, all of my words to please him. Only, only God can do that when he gives somebody a brand new heart. But then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Old things are passed away. Behold, look, see, all things are made new. A brand new person doesn't act like the old person. A brand new person doesn't talk like the old person doesn't think like the old person. In fact, a new person, a new creation has a new life and a new lifestyle. All right, I got one more passage of Scripture for you. This one's in 1 John chapter 1. If you'd make your way there. 1 John 1. Y'all still with me? All right. 1 John chapter 1. I just want to read a couple of verses over here. Beginning in verse 5. 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is not much darkness. And in him is, is just a little bit of darkness. In him is no darkness at all, none, zilch, zero, no darkness, no darkness, no darkness in God. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, I know the Lord. I walk with the Lord. Oh, yeah. Me and the Lord, we we tight, we tight. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. We lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, Now, this is what a child of God does. And walk, that means it's your way of life. This is how you live. You walk in the light as he is in the light, because in him is no darkness at all. Then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from many of our sins. From much, most. No, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all, all, all. Not much, not most, not much, but all. Praise God. All the sins, all the sins of my youth, all my doubts, my rebellion, my backsliding, cleansed, washed away, removed. The sins of my past, the small sins, the great sins, the profanity, the ungodliness, drunkenness, lying, resisting the truth, wickedness, idolatry, witchcraft, false religion, Occultism of all kinds, all those sins washed, cleansed, forgiven, erased by the blood of Jesus. The sins of commission, (laughs) you start, start talking about the sins of commission, things that you did and you ought not to have done, that would be a long list. And then the sins of omission. This might be a longer list. The things that 
I didn't do, I should have done. All these sins, washed, cleansed, erased, forgiven. All the times when my love failed and my flesh prevailed, when I gave in to anger or doubt or fear or flesh of whatever kind, whenever I failed to do as I should have done, failed to act as I should have acted, failed to speak as I should have spoken, failed to respond like I should have, failed to love as I should have, all that mountainous accumulation of sin's debt was by God forgiven, by God entirely erased. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. Sin's payment, paid in full. The debt of sin canceled. You know when that happened? When I was washed in the blood of the Lamb. You still right here in 1 John. I want you to look with me again. Verse 5, God is light. He is light. In him is no darkness, no darkness at all. There's no gray areas here. There's no compromise with this world. In him is light. If we say we have fellowship with him, we have fellowship with God. We walk with God. That's what it means. We walk with God. I walk with Jesus. But at the same time, we walk in darkness and walking. Again, this speaks of your lifestyle. Then we're not half right. We're not mostly right or mostly wrong. In fact, he says, if you say you walk with God and you walk in darkness, then you lie because the Lord doesn't walk in darkness at all. You lie and you do not tell the truth. You say one thing, but you practice another. No child of God, no true child of God walks in the dark. That is, you don't live a lifestyle of darkness and sin. It doesn't mean you don't stumble. doesn't mean you don't fall. doesn't mean you don't stain your garments again, which is why we need the continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus, which is exactly what verse 7 says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Cleanseth. It's in the continuous sense. It continues to cleanse us. It washes us. We get dirty every day. It's why you bathe. Well, just like you pick up the dirt from this world, we pick up the stain of sin because none of us have reached perfection. But the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing. And down in verse 9, if we confess our sins... If we confess our sins, and you know, this too is in the present tense, which means an ongoing action. We find ourselves confessing our sins regularly. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us from all. Have you faltered? Have you stumbled? Have you failed? The blood of Jesus Christ washes clean. He forgives. He forgives entirely. He doesn't forgive partially, but entirely. He keeps on cleansing us from all our sins, all our sins. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Washed, washed in the blood. We sang some wonderful songs this morning about the blood of Calvary. Many, many wonderful verses. There is another verse I want to cite this morning that I think is relevant. You don't have to turn here, but I think it's got particular relevance today. What Jesus told what God told the Jews to do when they were preparing to leave Egypt. 
He said in Exodus 12, 13, we talked about this earlier, but I want to read this to you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt, when I see the blood. They were to go inside that house, put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost and windows, and the angel of death would pass over that house. There's been a little post that's been appearing all over Facebook repeatedly, and it's a wonderful post. But it says this, that God didn't make say, make sure everybody inside that house is worthy to be passed over. It just said, be inside the house and be under the blood. Because there is nobody worthy. There is nobody worthy. And even now, we're not worthy to be forgiven. But for us to doubt God's forgiveness is a sin in itself because we are disbelieving that the blood of Calvary's cross, the sacrifice that Christ made for us, would be sufficient to eradicate our sins. Ever since that first Passover celebration, Passover has been a part of the Jewish culture for 3,500 years. 3,500 years. For the last 2,000, there's been no blood sacrifice. But it was at a Passover meal when the temple was still standing. At a Passover meal, the Lord had his disciples together that he transformed the Passover for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and turned it into what we will observe today, the communion of the bread and cup. Because it was at a Passover meal where the Bible says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and break it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, you drink it, you drink all of it, all of you drink of it. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so today, as we take this bread and this cup, we're to remember that it's the blood of Calvary, which is now represented by this cup, and the death of Christ, which is represented by this bread, that we are partaking of Christ in the sense that we know that he died for us, that he died for our sins. And that this is no empty, meaningless ritual. This isn't something that we just do because that, well, that's just what they do at church. No, this is declaring to all the world, Christ died for me. I know it. I believe it. I embrace it. And so we never forget the, Christ, the, the price Christ paid. He established that communion, the communion of the bread and cup, that is, these elements, this holy communion, or Lord's Supper, as some call it, that it would endure on earth until Christ returns. So today we are going to take these communion elements, and we're going to remember that, well, Ephesians 1 says we have redemption through his blood. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, We're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're going to remember the overcomers in the book of Revelation were singing a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and nation and people and tongue, thou has redeemed us by thy blood. We go back to the, the songs like we sang today. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Another old song we used to sing, Are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Father, we pray today. I pray for everyone here that we would ever remember, ever remember the price you paid for our sins. Sin so deep, sin so ingrained in us that nothing else could erase the stain of our sin. So, Lord Jesus, we pray today. I pray that you pour the blood of Jesus over each and every one of us. Pour that blood, Lord. Just as Israel dipped that hyssop in blood, the blood of the sacrificial lamb, and brushed it on the doorpost and windows of their homes, Lord Jesus, we plunge ourselves beneath the fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins, that sinners who are washed beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Wash us clean. Purge us, purify us, everyone, Lord. Wash away the sin of our past, the sin of our present. Wash away every sin, every stain, all guilt, all shame, all condemnation, every sin, Lord. Cleanse us whole, make us whole. Lord, we pray it today in Jesus' name. would like for our musicians to come and as they come I'd like for our our brothers to come we're going to pass out these communion elements as brother Joe said when they pass out the bread and the cup just hold on to it and then we'll all partake together pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds and by his wounds we are healed he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, and by his wounds, we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice and the life. transgressions he was crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds and by his wounds we are healed he 
was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice and the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price. By your grace we are saved. We are saved. was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds we are Did we get everybody? Did we miss anyone? We covered the nursery already? Oh. Did everyone receive the bread and cup for taking with us today? Paul wrote, for I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We take this bread today, Lord, with thankful hearts remembering, remembering the price you paid, turning your body over to death, to stripes, to wounds, to the thorns, to the sword, to the nail, to the cross. Price for our sins would be paid, paid in full. We take this today with grateful hearts and we remember. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, you do proclaim the Lord's death, until he come, till he returns. 
Lord, we take this cup and we remember. We remember that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We remember that you shed your blood for our forgiveness. That we might be made every whit whole. That the entire entirety of our sins would be removed, forgiven, atoned for. We take this cup with grateful hearts and we remember. Hallelujah. And for the cleaning lady's sake, I hope we didn't get any on the carpet. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is a it is a solemn thing, and yet it is a time of rejoicing. That all our sins are washed away. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Hallelujah. And if we can pray with you this morning, if you have a need for prayer, for anointing with oil, for ministry, agreement in prayer, if you've never really committed your life to Christ to be born again and washed in the blood, then today is your day. Let us pray for you before we dismiss. And then remember, when we dismiss... Everybody's invited to Miss Jackie's 80th birthday party. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's worship.